Hello and welcome back to the Evolution of Medicine news video cast. It is Saturday the 13th of February 2016. It's been another interesting week in the news and I'm here back with my co-founder as ever, Gabe Hoffman. Welcome to the show, Gabe. Hey James, good to be here. Good to have you here. This week's episode is sponsored by Embody360. It is a new technology that is going to be debuting at the Integrated Health Symposium in a couple of weeks. Um, it is a really powerful tool for getting adherence with clients. There's a lot of great stuff to it. As we go through the next few months, we're going to be talking about some of the different features uh, on the news and in our uh, on the functional forum. So watch out for that. So um, you know, this uh, is an interesting week in the news, as I said, and uh, I think for all of us. Um, you know, especially if you've been following the news about the Zika virus, uh, you've been introduced to possibly a new word, which is microcephaly. And uh, if you don't know how to pronounce it, I've got Google here to help you. It sounds like this. Microcephaly. Microcephaly. So um, microcephaly is an abnormal smallness of the head. And according to uh, Google is a congenital condition. But that's not really what we're seeing right now. So Obama has asked for 1.8 billion to fight the Zika virus, mainly because of the pictures of the microcephalies that you're seeing, the rare birth defect in Latin American nations, maybe in Brazil. But, um, you know, if you have been following the news and, and you look in other places, you'll see that this isn't necessarily consistent. And we're not exactly sure what's going on because in Colombia, we've got 3,177 pregnant women with Zika with no microcephaly. So, um, you know, you don't need to be a scientist to know that something doesn't really add up right there. And then you've got here Argentinian and Brazilian doctors saying that they, they suspect the mosquito insecticide as a cause of microcephaly. So there's obviously some confusion about what's going on. It seems a bit insane to allocate 1.8 billion when you're not really sure what is going on. Gabe, what were your thoughts on this? I know that you've been uh, following. It's been hard not to follow it. It's been everywhere. Well, you know, one of the articles I saw, it really, it talks about Latin America. It talks about Nicaragua. And I was just in uh, Nicaragua two weeks ago. And my girlfriend is still there now. And it really wasn't a big deal. But when I came back here, I was reading these articles and it was talking about how Nicaragua has this, all this Zika virus and it, it hasn't, you know, and I spilled, I, I was just speaking to her earlier today and she can't believe that all the, um, all the hoopla around it now. In addition to that though, we, we see it showing up in other places. Clearly the mic microcephaly is, uh, is, is scary and it's a scary image. It's just so you know, it's more of the same. I mean, we see this pattern a lot, but it's like, like, here's an article talking about how we don't even know if it's a mosquito. And then here's our president waging a $2 billion war against mosquitoes. So, you know, I mean, it's, um, it brings up a lot of interesting topics that we talk about in regards to health with, with the functional medicine community. And that not that we talk about, but that we learn about through listening to the doctors in our community. And then at the same time, it shows the disparity, uh, the discrepancy in information. That's common knowledge, and 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 the way we look at viruses and genetics and epigenetics and how things are passed down, etc. Yeah, well, you know what it definitely made me think of as I was watching back the uh, interview with Penelope Jagessa Schaefer from the December forum on detox, and she was talking about transgenerational epigenetics, which the endocrine society talking about, you know, toxins said, look, there's transgenerational epigenetics, and you don't have to, you know, you can see the grandchildren of, um, you know, people that we sprayed with Agent Orange in the Vietnam War. I say we, um, a very loose we, but, you know, that, that America did. And, you know, here you have a situation where, you know, she talked on the show where you don't really know how these toxins express themselves in the first generation and then even the second generation. They're seeing these, like, higher levels of pediatric cancers in, um, you know, in, in uh, toxic kids. The lidamide was a transgenerational epigenetic effect. So here's the Brazil foreign, the health minister saying, saying it's 100% certainty that there's a link between Zika and the microcephaly. But, you know, these, this, here's this article saying that Argentinian and Brazilian doctors suspect the mosquito insecticide. And it says here, since 2014, the insecticide, this insecticide has been used to kill mosquito in water tanks in Brazil. So they're like, okay, we're just going to put this, you know, this uh, insecticide into water tanks. Obviously, people are drinking that water. 
So I think there's more here to meet the eye. And I, I think certainly when you see that people say there's 100% certainty over something where there obviously isn't because um, this, this foreign minister, the health minister has obviously never been to Colombia um, and is not listening to the New York Times, you know, showing that they have, you know, a statistically significant number of pregnant women with known microcephaly. So uh, it's just a, it's an interesting time. And we see these kind of things play out. You know, it makes me think of Flint, Michigan again, whereas for like a year and a half, nothing to see here. And then suddenly they're like, oh yeah, sorry, we're poisoning you the whole time. You know, I mean, this is fascinating here with 30, you know, the, the Colombian article, you think about the, you know, the pesticide or the insecticide people. I mean, the ba- one of the main differences and in what information gets gets sent out to us, and we know this, is, look, the mosquitoes don't have a very big budget. They don't have a lot of money to throw at, you know, the type of publicity they get in the PRs. Insecticide companies have more. So always it's, it's easier to blame a mosquito than it would be to blame a chemical that's being produced uh, and, and making money. Now, that doesn't mean that's always what happens, and it's not always the chemical's problem. But very often, you'll hear a lot more about the mosquitoes than you will about the chemical that could be actually at fault. And it has a lot to do with money. It would be hard to... Well, you know who has the smallest advertising budget of all, Gabe, is our own genes, because they seem to get blamed for a lot. (laughs) That's That's a great point. So look, I would just say to anyone who's listening, just be, uh, you know, be cautious over what you read on the internet and, uh, you know, try and uh, think objectively and know that, you know, we can, if we're learning anything from, you know, Flint, we, we covered Flint at the beginning, you know, look, there's massive fiduciary responsibility on behalf of everyone not to report the truth. If you're this insecticide company and you realize what well, we're making kids with small heads, you need to make sure at all costs that that doesn't come back to the company because the CEO of that company has a fiduciary responsibility to his shareholders to make sure that the the share price doesn't drop. And so, you know, um, that there's obviously a a value in, in deflecting it. And I think those are some of the most powerful forces in the world right now, because that's, you know, that that's, um, you know, people will contain those costs or they, people will think about those kind of costs when they're making their decisions and then they think about their family and whatever. So, you know, I think that um, this is probably the most uh, accurate lens to look at this through. But certainly it's an interesting story. It's developing, you know, like Flint, Michigan, you know, we caught it right at the beginning of this newscast. It was the first thing that we talked about and it became a huge international deal. Zika is becoming that. They're saying now, oh, they're not going to send the American, um, Olympic team to the Olympics in Brazil in 2016. Um, so, you know, I think this will be something that will definitely develop and something definitely to, uh, to keep an eye on. Absolutely. So let's uh, move on to the next topic. We've, we've had a lot of Zika here. This was an interesting topic that I saw come up this week, which is um, Sonos and Apple did an experiment which demonstrate how music changes behavior at your home. So, you know, one of the first things I thought was super interesting about this is like, this is citizen science. You know, this is uh, Apple and Sonos, not traditional behemoths in the science world doing a 30,000 person experiment because they can, because they've got these things out there. So I think it's really fascinating on one hand to science to be coming from new areas. Um, and, uh, and, you know, obviously this article is, uh, is interesting in itself because it talks about the, you know, biochemical and then bio, you know, behavioral effects of different music. And, um, yeah, Gabe, I'd, I'd love to get your thoughts on this. Well, it's awesome. I mean, there, there's so much exciting things going on here. Um, first off, the people who are doing the study, like you had mentioned before, th- this is a very, uh, you don't we don't always associate Sonos with looking at our health, obviously, but this is what's starting to change. Our companies are fascinated by our behavior, and our behavior is very much dictating our health. And then it's if, as a practitioner, you think to yourself, you know, am I asking the people I work with how not just the food that, that's affecting their environment, but what is their environment like? What kind of music are they listening to? Are they listening to music? Do they like music? Do they? And, and just starting to ask some questions that sort of uh, we, we may not have occurred to us to ask before that now we realize is, is giving you a good barometer and, and some information about someone's health and also giving you some, some interesting, more creative suggestions that people might connect to, like listen to this type of music for this much time, experiment with that, play with that. It's more fun. It brings a different type of energy into the situation. And what we saw a couple of functional forms ago when we were looking at brain recovery 
is that different, uh, when we use different senses of the body, we stimulate different areas of the brain. So if you are dealing with music, obviously you're, you're dealing with sound uh, and, and the ears, and that's affecting a different part of the brain than if you're dealing with food or if you're dealing with um, essential oils and, and smells. And so it, it's, it's interesting on, a, on a several levels. Yeah, no, definitely super interesting. And, you know, like, yeah, Datis Karazian on the January forum talking about how do you actually regrow neurons or reconnect neurons. And it was, um, it was really about different types of things from smells to sounds. And, you know, this is a, a key way to do that. You know, Daniel Leberton is, is talked about a lot in this book because he wrote, he's a doctor and he wrote, uh, this is your brain on music. It's a best selling book. And, um, you know, he said, music historically has been a group experience. Um, and he argues that it serves an evolutionary purpose. And I was just thinking about that, Gabe, with regard to the Functional Forum, because I know that a lot of people, what they like about it when they show up is that we have cool music. That's right. We, we always have the, uh, the James Brown playlist radio uh, going. And you know, we, we realized early on when, you, when you're creating an event, Music is a key factor, and any time you're bringing people together in a group, music always changes the energy and the vibe of what's going on, and this study shows that. It shows that people don't just enjoy music. They actually are going to spend more time closer together. It talks about uh, 85% higher chance that someone's going to invite someone else over when they're listening to music, when music's on. Uh, people spend more time together. There's so much interesting uh, statistics in here, but basically just shows you music is generating some sort of impulse or energy field or a, ability to attract us to be closer to each other. Exactly. Yeah. Definitely check out this article because it talks about the creation of oxytocin, the love hormone, serotonin. You know, a lot of practitioners are looking to balance these things like balance serotonin and to look at these, these levels. And so, you know, I always think about the homeopathic intake, right? If there's one thing that homeopaths maybe do better than any other practitioner is ask good questions because they got two hours to do the intake and they would always ask like, Hey, what kind of music do you listen to? Maybe this is something that, you know, we can help patients with, particularly now as there's no excuse not to be able to listen to music because in the past, maybe you had to own all the music unless you want to listen to the radio and the radio has got tons of ads that I always find annoying, um, especially growing up in the UK where you had like ad free radio. But now, um, you know, with things like Pandora and Spotify and these streaming services, you can basically listen to any music you want, any style. There's tons of studies on classical music and its role in, in helping baby development so you know asking your patients you know what kind of music they listen to is uh you know probably not a bad idea and especially if they're you know we've talked before we've had george slavich on the podcast talking about social isolation you know if you have patients who are socially isolated and that's a bigger determinant of health than diet exercise or smoking then um, maybe one of the ways that you know as they start to develop new relationships uh, potentially music is a way that they can um, they can do that and now you're really you know you're really helping them in ways that probably no other health practitioner has ever helped them so that was some interesting stuff there on music and then uh, Gabe found this article here on um, biohackers implanting computers earbuds and antennas in their bodies now um, Gabe what, what was it about this article that you thought was interesting well I mean it, <clears throat> it certainly ties into the the wearables and the measurements and, and all the things that we've been talking about relative to the forum. It also ties into, you know, some of the probably the well-deserved paranoia that we're going to be carrying around microchips where you can act that's actually going to be embedded in our bodies. And, and that is, can be a little creepy. And these pictures really freak me out when I look at them. Although you comforted me <clears throat> by describing that, you know, the first, uh, the first way we were flying planes looked insane too. And then you kind of got to work through these stages. But um, I guess that, you know, the question is, is just a matter of time. We're already carrying our cell phones around us. I mean, I, I have the thing in my hand all the time. Is it just really going to be more convenient to just install it right in our body? I mean, it seems like the next logical step in some ways. Well, look at this picture. It looks like this guy's basically stuck his iPhone and just stuck it in under his skin. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, he, he's, um, yeah, it's, it's really weird to look at. And, you know, a, a separate article I found this week talked about the fact that, you know, we, we've talked a lot about measuring and uh, the whole movement of keeping track of the steps we're taking and the calories we're taking in. 
And there was an article describing how it really doesn't impact behavior as much as we like it to. And usually people do it for a few weeks and forget about it. So I would just say it would be a bummer if you had your iPhone implanted in your forearm only to get bored with it after three weeks. Yeah, no, um, maybe start with a Fitbit and see how you go. But yeah, look, these are obviously people who are, you know, who are on the cutting edge of, of seeing this uh, singularity between man and machine. And it's definitely an interesting uh, topic. And it's somewhat aligned with functional medicine. I mean, I've thought for a long time that, you know, as more and more people are measuring themselves, they'll want to improve the numbers on whatever they're measuring. And, and regular medicine is not really designed for that. You know, that's really what functional medicine is designed to do, to improve function. And so I think it's only a good thing that more people are measuring if for no other reason apart from the fact that now they'll be looking for things that can improve that function and, you know, they'll be eventually looking for medical care that can improve that function. And that's one of the reasons that, you know, one of the converging things that I see of why functional medicine, integrated medicine will take off because all of our work is, is uh, designed to actually improve numbers, to improve function. And so as more and more people get into this, I think it's only good for our industry. So um, I'm, uh, I'm pretty excited about the biohacking movement generally to, you know, to raise up our industry. But obviously, um, you know, the, the beginnings of it sometimes look a little bit, uh, what would you say, you know, a little bit um, painful. <laughs> and insane. I mean, yeah. what, you know, I'd be interested to see what the, what the community feels about some of these topics because I, I think you'll get a range of feelings and opinions here because it is, um, in some ways, it's in alignment with what, you know, what we see as helping people with their health. And in some ways it's very much, you know, in opposition of maybe where we want to see life go. Cause we're looking at getting into nature and realizing we have to be around nature more, but we're also seeing how technology helps us. And all of a sudden we're putting technology right into our body. So it's an interesting, you know, juxtaposition and, uh, you know, be, be interesting to hear how everyone feels about it. Absolutely. So if you're listening to this, we'd love to hear your comments in uh, below. Uh, definitely share your thoughts here and also send us news clips. You know, we will also have you know, news from the community. If you can send it to news at goevomed.com and you can also, uh, you know, get involved. You know, if you think you'd like to see someone as a guest on the show to do the news, uh, we, we had John Weeks last week and it was a, you know, people really seem to like having a new voice and bringing people bringing their new news to it. So this is something that we're going to keep doing. And and so, uh, yeah, we appreciate the community. We'd love to hear your thoughts on all of these things. Um, and, uh, you know, we'll continue the conversation on Facebook and also on uh, all the other places where you find this, uh, on uh, where you find people through audio podcasts and then also on our YouTube channel. So thanks so much for listening. I've been here with my partner, Gabe Hoffman. This is the Evolution of Medicine news video cast. Thanks again to Embody360 for sponsoring this news video cast. Um, I think next month, when you see us unleash Embody 360 at the Functional Forum with Jeff Bland and Kelly Brogan uh, on 229, you'll see that uh, you know it's going to be a great technology for helping to coach and get the most value out of your relationship, the patient-practitioner relationship. Um, so check out goevomed.com slash embody, and you can be one of the first people to find out about it. We're really excited about bringing it to you, the community. I'm your host, James Maskell. This is the Evolution Medicine News Videocast, and we'll see you next time.